Welcome to this evening's classic episode. Uh, do you guys remember Princess Diana? Feels like a little softball. But. Well, I mean, I don't. I didn't know her personally, but um, she certainly loomed large in my childhood, just on like the news, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, her tragic demise was a massive media frenzy that just could not be ignored. Yeah, I, I recall a lot of positivity reported oh, on her in her life, at least here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know throughout the rest of the world and in a lot of places, even in Great Britain, there were other things swirling about her in the news and in the rumor mills. And her death caused such, you know, a shock to the to the system, I think, globally. Um, mm-hmm. There were so many things written about it and, you know, proposed mm-hmm. about why her death occurred. Yeah. It certainly reframed the way the world thought about paparazzi. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Born on July 1st, 1961, dead in a horrific car crash, only age 36 on August 31st, 1997. Uh, people are still wondering, speculating about exactly what happened. And here in our classic episode from 2019, we dive all the way in. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deck, and most importantly, you are you. You are here. So cheerio. That makes this stuff they don't want you to know. A bit of a British episode for us today. We're going across the pond. Pip, pip. As they called it in the transatlantic times. Not many people say over the pond these days. Kelly ho Sure, yeah. That's all I got. I love pip, pip. People need to bring that back. I've, I've, I've been tremendously instrumental in bringing back Tut Tut, such that some of my friends banned me from it for a few months. Yeah. There are times when, in a serious, somber moment in someone's life, Matt, they don't need to hear the phrase Tut Tut. It's as unhelpful as saying, I told you so, or that reminds me of a thing that happened to me. You well, know what I mean? It's just a verbal stand-in for a finger wag, isn't it? It's a bit, yeah, I feel maybe a little aw shucksy too, you know? Mm-hmm. Like uh, if, if if a kid is scared of a thunderstorm or something, it's like tut-tut. I don't know. I've definitely experienced a few, it's not erroneous tut-tuts, but just tut-tuts that appear out of nowhere when I'm not expecting them. Oh, really? Like yeah. in the wild, in, in the field? The, in the field. Mm. Wait, doesn't Pooh Bear say tut-tut? It looks like rain? Oh, I don't know. It I is, think, yeah. I think he does. Tut-tut is a small admonishment or disappointment. That's that's exactly where I've been hearing it. I've got oh a giant book of Winnie the Pooh stuff I'm reading with my son, and he totally says tut tut. Oh, uh, dude, your kid's so cool. Oh, you're that's so awesome. cool for uh, bringing the poo, man. <laughs> bringing the poo. <laughs> got to bring the poo, dude. None of my heroes wear pants. It's true. Uh, why are we talking about British nomenclature and terminology? It's a great question. We can answer it now. Uh, it's a little bit of a downer answer. It turns out that on August 31st, 1997, Diana, known as the Princess of Wales, died in a Parisian hospital as the result of injuries from a car crash. This is something that our fellow listeners have been asking us about for, I mean, since we started the show, it's one of the first suggestions we got. And we just now Never did it because, again, we were originally video only. Yes, and our video did cover uh, some of the main things we will be discussing today. But we, in this format, get to dig deep. Yeah, it's going to get weird. Uh, her driver was a guy named Henri Paul. Her boyfriend was a guy named Dodi Fayed. And her boyfriend's security guard, one Trevor Rees Jones, were all in the car when the accident occurred. And we were not to not to date the three of us too hard, but we were all alive at this time. Um, for those of us who were residents of, of this part of the world, that's right after the Olympics, like a year after the the nineteen ninety six Summer Olympics. Um, and maybe we're too young to remember where we were when we heard about this, but a lot of people around the planet know exactly 
where they were when the news broke. Do you guys remember? Do you have any memories of this? I was 14 at my parents' house. I know that for sure. Oh, <laughs> you're just doing the math there. Yeah, right? I'm just doing the math in I the guess, general. Yeah, we're, this, we're, we're roughly the same age, I believe, man. I guess so. I think so. We've never really compared, but it feels like we are. So I was probably in the neighborhood of 14. I remember probably being at my neighbor's house. That's what I'm going to say. I was Ooh. at my neighbor's house. Heard? Yeah, it's strange. It's uh, for a lot of people in in the UK or in the Commonwealth, it, the impact of the tragedy was similar to that of 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. They remember exact moment that they heard this news. And it's strange because the two tragedies I just mentioned involved thousands of people, and this involves three deaths, and really just one that the public appeared to care about. But Diana was like a symbol, right? I mean, she was seen as this, she was this beloved princess, she was seen as the epitome of goodness and light, you know, in their country, Mm. and then the death in and of itself, of course, was tragic, but it also uncovered a bit of scandal that maybe tempered some of those uh, feelings of affection and admiration for this person. And both of these uh, instances have another thing in common where there are a tremendous number of people who believe that there is something fishy about them, that perhaps there was some kind of inside job at play. Absolutely. Good point. Well said. So here are the facts. She's not born the Princess of Wales. Diana is born Diana Frances Spencer on July 1st, 1961. She's already part of of the um, the long-running 1% of the UK, the aristocracy, the people who own most of the land and have for hundreds and hundreds of years, which apparently you're not supposed to talk about there. But that's, the pro- that's one of the huge problems with the country. Everything's fine. Keep calm. Carry on. <laughs> right, right, right. Don't ask questions. So Diana was a child of Viscount and Viscountess Althorpe, In February of 1981, she becomes engaged to Prince Charles. He's the oldest son of the British Queen Elizabeth II. In a very Hamilton-esque move, Charles had previously been engaged to Diana's older sister, one lady, Sarah McCockerdell, and Diana and Charles went on about 12 dates before they announced their engagement, so it's it's like Vegas-style in terms of the speed of their relationship. And they had met previously before when she was 16 and he was 29. Uh, They were wed five months after announcing their engagement at St. Paul's Cathedral on July 29th, 1981. People loved it. People were all about uh, the aristocracy and um, the entire, you know, the theater of that system. Yes. And so... They, I can't just say, they, at the risk of being ageist, that that age difference of 29, 16 is, in my mind, personally, a little bothersome. But, mm-hmm. you know, who cares? Whatever. Just for the record, anybody wants to know the code or the, uh, the formula sure. is half your age, age plus, plus seven. seven. Okay. That's the official okay to date I feel though that people, and this is not a ding on you, man, but I, I feel I've heard that before and often when I've heard it recited that way – it's it's from um, like we're friends, but it's, it's from someone that I don't trust because my immediate question, especially if I don't know them well, is how many times did you run this formula? How many yeah. are you one of those guys? Well, like, Ben, first of all, I'm being tongue in cheek when yeah. I say that there's a magic formula that uh, tells you who you are and are not allowed to date. But I agree with you, Ben. When someone sense. really says that with a straight face. Then, yeah, suspect. it's like when someone knows the intricacies of a weird series of laws. Yeah, like they're they're like, look, you know, I mean, quaaludes and intent to for an intent to distribute. It's really a lot of people think it's based just on the weight, but it's also based on how it's packaged. And you're like, cool, man. I just wanted a sprite. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't want any quaaludes in your Sprite, Ben? Yeah. No, no, no. Shout out to Church's Chicken. And shout out to uh, something else. This is completely irrelevant. I know we're going to get back on the topic soon. But did you know that 7-Up used to have lithium in it? And yes. And up, it was like represented like an up in your mood? Mm-hmm. I, I did not, did not know, that. know that. I knew about cocaine and Coca-Cola, but I did not know about lithium and 7-Up. Opium as well was quite common in a lot of those curative drinks. We could go ahead and 
that's a good episode. If let's Saber just, doesn't beat us to it. Let's just switch gears, guys. Let's talk about no, I'm just joking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll just go for the rest of the episode and pretend that it was about that. But not Sprite. It was 7-Up. Okay. So, uh, so speaking of fantastic segues, uh, the Diana and Charles marriage produces two sons, or they call them having issue when you're uh, – when you're no- – when you're, you know, you win the genetic lottery and your nobility. And uh, these would go on to be the tremendously popular princes, William and Harry. The marriage was the subject of tons of rumor mongering and, and muck raking in the local tabloids, which makes sense. What was that? Was in the old Eleanor Roosevelt quote uh, that said, small minds talk about people. Uh, middling minds talk about events and great minds talk about ideas. There's always going to be money in celebrity reporting. It's the banana stand of journalism, you know? There's money in it. There's money in it, always. So despite the fact that this marriage was seen as this continual source of like Kardashian-level reality TV show uh, vicarious train wreck scandals – Diana herself was, just as you said, Noel, seen as a symbol, a cultural icon, despite um, <laughs> despite the reality of who she was in society and where she came from. She was respected for her charity work, which was serious, uh, including using the access to tremendous wealth and influence she had to support hospitals to advocate for the eradication of landmines and to raise awareness of HIV, AIDS, uh, mental illness, and cancer. So people people felt, you know, um, that they identified with her mission. You know, more than, a, more than a few folks would hear about this work and say, that's what I would do. You know yeah. what I mean? Like if I had that power, that's what I would do and then add the human element of being stuck in a bad relationship. And how how could you not care about this stranger a little bit? Oh, absolutely. It, I mean, to have royalty care at all, you know, within the ivory towers of royalty that that people are suffering from something, whether it is from from cancer or uh family members and friends being under threat of landmines everywhere. That's one of those mm-hmm. those subjects that doesn't, at least nowadays, get much attention at all. But that's still a thing across the world, uh, the danger of landmines. And mm-hmm. this was literally the princess who gave a crap. Right, right. And so people in general felt a, felt a little convicted. People were very uh, – you hear this a lot in fiction nowadays – uh, when we're when we're living through the stories of people on screen or on a page, uh, you hear someone say, "I'm team whatever" or "I'm team blah blah blah." Uh, there were people who were team uh, the establishment, you know, Buckingham, team Buckingham. Let's call it that, and then team Diana. But everybody pretty much knew all was not well over in Chuck and Diana's crib. The media was able to confirm extramarital affairs on both sides of the bed. And eventually, even Charles' parents got involved. Let's try to talk these kids off a ledge. So Charles' parents, Queen Elizabeth II, you know, Queen Elizabeth, she's still kicking around, uh, and Prince Philip met with the couple for kind of like a impromptu marriage counseling session, an intervention of sorts. Uh, Philip and Diana exchanged uh, letters, very personal letters, um, that summer and in which uh, she expressed her disappointment at both her and Charles' extramarital affairs and asked her to see both of their slip-ups from the other person's point of view. Interesting and very s- seemingly progressive for what you would think would be a very rigid high society kind of situation. Especially since Prince Philip is on record calling people things like spear chuckers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Philip, isn't he the one who – He like, has a cargo cult? Yeah, but they, like I think they recently took away his license to drive. Yes. Because he was crashing into stuff because he's like 100 or something now. Yeah, he's quite, he's quite elderly. He is not uh, – he is not a perfect person. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at one point, Philip seemed completely just overwhelmed, ready to give up, and he wrote, quote, I will always do my utmost to help you and Charles to the best of my ability, but I am quite ready to concede that I have no talent as a marriage counselor. Um, I can I can only imagine yeah. someone who has lived the life of Prince Philip, like trying to get into those uh, – the deep interpersonal 
relationships in that way when you're when the life that you live is so guarded from other people just by its nature that's very empathetic of you you know what i mean i think that's really i think that's really generous of you okay no it's true matt because it is hard to even understand how someone with this much privilege raised with this much privilege could even wrap their heads around or even attempt to exercise this kind of understanding you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's without me knowing what it what it really is. But my my also that's true. my understanding of uh, just the the schedule that you must keep the the rigorous relationships of convenience mm-hmm. and uh, just all the things you have to do to uphold your image. Right. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't lead to a lot of heartfelt talks, in my opinion. He does sound like a like a genuinely concerned kind of parent. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like if you've ever been on the outs with a significant other, I'm sure many of us listening have been in that situation where you're like, well, it's not working out with the person I'm dating, but her or his parents are amazing. You know what I mean? And then they, they, they like, give you advice. Like, ah, you know, it's, it's my kid. What can I say? They're kind of like that sometimes. But you'll work it out. You'll work it out. You're young. Yeah, but in this case, they didn't work it out. No, they did not. Their attempts at reconciliation on all sides were unsuccessful. In December, things start to hit the fan. Prime Minister John Major publicly announces the pair's amicable separation, reading a statement from the royal family. Uh, December 20th, Buckingham Palace announces that the Queen has written separate le- – the British Queen, Elizabeth, has written separate letters to the couple, ordering them to file for divorce as soon as possible. This was a huge scandal at the time. People were getting their popcorn in bulk. After considering the present situation, the Queen wrote to both the Prince and the Princess earlier this week and gave them her view, supported by the Duke of Edinburgh, that's uh, Philip, that an early divorce is desirable. And boom, 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 snap, crackle, pop, by August 28th, 1996, the divorce was official. Isn't that interesting? The uh, the divorce is desirable. Y- y- y'all are making us look bad. They called it an early divorce. I know. You know like, don't drag this out. <laughs> just just get it over with. Let's move on. Just your your relationship is old yeller. We're at the end of the story. Just take it out back. Well, you have to imagine too that I, I believe it was Charles that first was discovered to have been cheating on Diana. That's correct. With Camilla Parker Bowles, who he's now married to. Um, which maybe led Diana to seek her own extramarital affair. And then maybe at that point it kind of become an under, became an understanding between the two because they were certainly was they were not in it to win it. They were going to maybe keep it up for the, for the public image of it all. But even that I think became untenable because you see pictures of them during these periods and they're sitting at different tables with their backs to each other. It's a very Cold War, unfriendly kind of situation. Not any fun to be in and try to keep up appearances, I'm sure. No. There's a sad moment in an interview – where they're talking about their engagement early on and some some reporter, I don't know if they were in the inner circle, um, but s- some reporter says, you know, oh, so you're in love, blah, blah, blah. And then the uh, Diana character says, oh, yes, we're in love. And then uh, the uh, Chuck says, whatever that means, each dies or something like that. And it's just, it's not a good look. It's a cringe. But yeah. Yeah, you're right. There, it's a political alliance as much as a um, a relationship. The idea of the idea of marrying and being in a relationship at all for the purposes of romance is relatively recent in our history, or it's rather it's relatively recent for it to be a commonplace thing. And so the old laws or the old mores probably still hold in a lot of um, royal families, you know. And it gets nasty. The public is loving this. Uh, Princess Diana has a tell-all interview with the BBC, which is very rare for the uh, royal family at all. Because as you said, Matt, they function under many constrictions or, I don't know, traditions about how they're supposed to be regarded or speak to anyone who is, again, outside of their inner circle. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that interview was with Martin Bashir, and that's a very memorable interview if you were alive then. Um because in it, she talks about all kinds of details. She Again, she talks about how she was unfaithful. She talks about Charles's affair. And she has a very famous quote that she gave while in that interview. And she said, there were three of us in this marriage. So it was a bit crowded. 
and to that end, she's talking about Camilla Parker Bowles. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's pretty tough. Yeah, and again, though, to, to Ben's point about how marriage for love wasn't a thing, I mean, these two were completely paired up for political reasons between these families, and uh, Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles had dated, like, in the 70s. Like, they yeah. already had a relationship, and then when he got paired off with Diana, she ended up marrying her, you know, former boyfriend of hers, and then they kind of reconnected. So it's sort of like... It was set yeah. up to fail. Yeah, but Chuck did choose Diana over her sister, right? I mean, that's one of the first things Ooh. we set up there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm I guess I'm just saying here. I'm just saying the whole system of arranged marriages is a little bit uh, uh, hinky. Well, there are people who would argue that the whole system of marriage in general is, has problems. Oh, here, here. Yeah. Uh, hey. Th- <clears throat> I said there were people who would. Okay. I was very respectful <laughs> and diplomatic. But yeah, you're, um, these, are, these are great points. Still, despite um, whatever uh, weird traditions or uh, cultural brainwashing may be in place in these sorts of systems, you can't change the fact that people are people. And these people are parents, right? So they have, they have their divorce, but that doesn't mean that – just because they're not uh, spouses doesn't mean they can't be good parents. So after the divorce, despite all the you know bad blood, it's water under the bridge, Charles and Diana work together to be decent parents to their kids after the divorce and continue to do so up until Diana's death in August 1997. I didn't know how old she was at the time. She was 36. Yeah. I, I just I, – I guess I thought she was older because, you know, she was – she had done so much with her life because, you know, she didn't have to have a, a job or, <laughs> or a mortgage or um, – <laughs> Student loans. Student loans or pay for insurance or um, – didn't have to do anything. No, not yeah. really. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny to me too. I think you, you, to your point as well, Ben, that she's lifted up as being this model – person, but you have to keep in mind that she was a model aristocrat who had unlimited resources. So all it took was a little bit of a streak of kindness that any Mm -hmm. people in her position could have done. But the fact is most of them just don't. (laughs) So she was kind of like the exception (laughs) to the rule because she was an incredibly wealthy person who very openly was kind to poor people as opposed to it not seeming like just like a tax write-off. She was very much in the field and visiting hospitals and Mm -hmm. all of this stuff. So I'm I'm just saying I'm not not diminishing – I don't think you are either, Ben, at all, any of the good works that she did. But it's certainly – easier to hold her up as a shining example of someone of that station because a lot of them are you know, yeah. pretty self-serving and awful. No but, matter what, she hmm. existed in that framework and sure. she did good. Right? And she was – oh, and some of the, the most influential work she did was making the royal family look good uh, for the um, people who support their existence. There you go. So it was <laughs> – it was as in the people of the United Kingdom, right? Yes, right, 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 right. Well, and uh, yeah, and all of the the other territories who also must, of course, you know, at least tip their hat to them. Can you imagine growing up in a council estate and walking by Buckingham Palace? It takes some some real uh, so, some some real well thought out rhetoric to make that feel like a good idea, right, yeah. for society. But that's – you know what? That's my opinion. I don't mean to dump on people's choice of tradition. We will return after the break because we have gotten to the pivotal night, the last night that Diana, Princess of Wales, spent on Earth. <laughs> Travel back with us, folks. It's August of 1997. Diana's 36. She's dating a 41-year-old man named Dodi Fayed. He is the son of a man named Mohammed Al-Fayed, a billionaire, the former owner of Harrod's department store. As a matter of fact, he owns a lot of stuff. He owns a yacht that Dodi and Diana are hanging out on, uh, and they leave the yacht kind of a vacation excursion thing, and they arrive in Paris. And they're hanging out in Sardinia, and they uh, they decide to take off. So Diana leaves in a private jet earlier on that same day, and she arrives in Paris with Dodie. And they're just planning to stop over briefly on their way to London uh, in Paris. And, you know, they, they spent nine days together on that yacht. And 
they were hanging out in the French and Italian Riviera, just having uh, a really good time together, spending some time. And uh, you can see lots of photos surrounding this time of them uh, from paparazzi and the like, because, you know, whenever, even though she was outside of the, of royalty, she was still one of the most photographed humans on the planet. Now, their plan was to stay at the Ritz Paris, uh, and this is another property, uh, like all the Herods, that Dodie's father owned, and they dined at a place called Ritz El Espaldon. I don't know how to say that correctly. Espaldon. Espaldon. And Diana, we know this, unfortunately, because of autopsy and because of, uh, you know, just records, but Diana had Dover sole vegetable tempura and an asparagus omelet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would prove to be her final meal. They were continually hunted by the press. If you've ever read Watership Down, there's a fantastic um, mythology that the rabbits in that story have about being the prince with a thousand enemies, you know. And they were in a kind of Watership Down situation. They were always being pursued. Uh, by serious journalists, by tabloid journalists, by freelance photographers, and so on. It was terrifying. A, that's a terrifying thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't say that I know what that's like, but I can imagine because you, you're using the word hunted. Yeah. And I would agree that that's exactly what it is. Sometimes they'll say hounded, but it's a synonym at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So now we return to a man named Henri Paul, an employee of Al Fayed's uh, Paris Ritz. He is the deputy head of security at the hotel, and he has been entrusted with the task of driving a rented black 1994 Mercedes-Benz S280 to elude the press. The idea is this, that they're going to send a decoy car out first and that the photographers and, and the press gang will follow that car and then the chauffeur, Paul, will – take Dodie and Diana to an apartment owned by Dowdy's father nearby and they will spend the night in that apartment, not in the Ritz, before they continue on to London. So this car, the car they're actually in, has four passengers. The driver, Dodie and Diana in the back, and the guy Trevor Reese Jones, a member of the Fayed family security team, riding shotgun. It's late. It's around 12 – it's after 12, 1220, 1223 or so. Uh, they're, they're driving and it turns out the decoy did not work as well as they want. The press is on to them. Picture people in motorcycles like hauling their keisters off and swerving Tokyo Drift style while there's another person on the back of the motorcycle leaning out at, at weird right angles to try to catch the uh, catch the um, Mercedes in action, hoping against hope that one of the tented windows is for some reason rolled down because if you can get these people's faces in a photograph, you have, you know, you have paid your rent for a month or so, you know what I mean? Because unlike the people in the Mercedes, they had jobs and mortgages and stuff like that. Mm. Do you guys remember the paparazzi mission and uh, that Grand Theft Auto game? I think it was the one in Los Santos, the most recent one. Yeah. You had to ride, you had to do some very similar stuff. It was like all about, you know, literally stalking people on, you know, tailing them in cars, riding alongside with motorcycles like you do in a game like that. But yeah, I mean, it's really, really nasty stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like more than just invasion of privacy, literally putting people at risk. Absolutely, which comes into play later because the driver loses control. Henri Paul loses control of the Mercedes at the entrance to the Pont de l'Alma tunnel. The car strikes the right-hand wall of the tunnel. It swerves to the left of the two-lane road before it collides head-on with one of the pillars, I think the 13th pillar supporting the roof of the tunnel. At this time, it's traveling about 105 kilometers per hour, 65 miles an hour. The reports will say between 60 and 70. The initial reports said 105 miles per hour, but surprise, surprise, somebody was lying to sell more papers. In an enclosed space, no less. Mm -hmm. That kind of speed... That's yeah. bad news. You can see photographs of the Mercedes and it looks ugly. You would think that everyone in there died instantly, uh, especially people in the front. 
Witnesses reported seeing smoke, and there were a ton of witnesses. They also reported that the area was swarming with photographers, and they were all over the car in motorcycles and other uh, other automobiles before the Mercedes enters the tunnel. This meant that as the victims lay in the vehicle, the press actually arrives before any emergency services. And this is where this is where we can look at the media. In, a, in an antagonistic way because a lot of these folks, a lot of these photographers panicked. They ran to the, the crash, you know, dropped their motorcycles, run out of their cars and they start tugging on the doors trying to save the lives of these, again, human people who have just been in a terrible car accident. But then other photographers stand back waiting, hoping against hope that someone pulls open that door of that Mercedes because sure, you can pay rent for a month or two if you get get someone's face in a photo, but if you get the face of a dying princess, you might be set. I mean, that might be a book deal for you. Yeah. Which is horrific. Yeah, that's grim all around because there's going to be Hope you hope that there's a certain amount of guilt on anyone who was pursuing that vehicle mm-hmm. once once it crashes and the feeling of oh no I need to help mm-hmm. what, what have I done kind of thing but you're right the self preservation and the self the desire to like you said pay a mortgage uh, something we hit on early on in this it's such a strong desire strong need to you know pay for rent pay for whatever to survive that. It overtakes, and that's what happens. Or maybe they were just uh, they were just competitive. You know, it was a cutthroat industry. They didn't want other people to get the shot. Could be that too. Either way, police later go on to seize film from seven different photographers on the scene. Six of them are French. One of them's from Macedonia. Uh, the cops ultimately take twenty rolls of film, which have not been seen. As morbid as it may sound. Kind of a good thing to have so many photographs snapped of a scene as it happened, as it took place Mm. in terms of solving the the, – I mean not that it was any mystery as to what happened but in terms of like evidence that could be entered into the – you know. That's a good – that's a very good point. You know, Uh, we don't know how much of it was kept from the public. We just have – in this case of uh, the confiscated stills, we just have the statements of the people who said their stuff was stolen. But and there are a few images that you can find. Yes, there are. There are. You can see the car when it's on the back of a tow truck. Yeah. Well, and there are a couple shots. Uh, this is the one. Well, I'm just going to show. It. Oh, there's there are a couple of shots in particular that look to be from the a car that is in front of their vehicle that's shooting in, and you can see the driver and uh, Trevor Reese oh, Jones. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can kind of see Princess Diana's the back of her head. Um, but you can see just from there that there's flash photography happening in the vehicle in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. Flash photography. That's going to be, that's going to be a huge part too, because we have to remember this took place in the late nineties. So, so what happens? We've got the scene of this car accident swarming with photographers, some helping, some not. And where are the police? So it takes the police 10 minutes to arrive and then the ambulance five minutes after that, so 15 minutes. Uh, and Henri Paul and Dodi Fayed were both dead or dying. They died at the scene. Um, Princess Diana was conscious and she was in shock. She was removed from the car at 1 a.m. And when she was moved, she went into cardiac arrest but was successfully resuscitated there on the scene. She was in the ambulance by 118 and left the scene around 141. And then finally, she made it to the hospital at around uh, 2.06 a.m. Fayed and Paul were both declared dead at the scene of the accident. Their bodies were not taken to a hospital. They were taken to a mortuary in Paris, the Institut Medico Legal. Diana's internal injuries, although she looked relatively okay on the exterior, her internal injuries were extensive. Her heart had been physically displaced to the right side of the chest. Just from impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this tore the pulmonary vein and the pericardium. Uh, This means that despite lengthy resuscitation attempts, including internal cardiac massage and emergency room work, 
uh, the Princess of Wales passed away at 4 a.m. on August 31st. An anesthesiologist named Bruno Rio uh, announced her death at 6 a.m. at a news conference held at the hospital. And thus it came to pass that by dawn, bodyguard Trevor Reese jones was the only survivor of the accident. And as you can imagine... An investigation ensued, a large investigation. And one person who will become one of the primary, um, I guess, sources of information and Mm -hmm. speculation after this is Muhammad Al-Fayed, Dodi's father. He, he came forth, he came out publicly and stated that his son Dodi and Diana were both murdered by the British royal family. And he started using all of his influence to try and find whatever evidence he could uh, find that this was the case. A billionaire is now facing the royal family. Which is honestly going to be one of the few forces that would be effective in presenting a counter argument. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And eventually, Al-Fayed totals up around 175 very specific claims that support his belief that it was indeed an inside job by the royal family. The French government follows up on each of Fayed's claims, Al-Fayed's claims, to the best of their ability. This quickly becomes the most expensive road accident investigation in all of French history, counting the time before the invention of the automobile. Autopsy reports from the mortuary we mentioned earlier found that the driver on Repol had been impaired while operating the vehicle at 0.175 grams of alcohol per milliliter of blood. He was around 3.5 times over the legal limit for driving in France. Additionally, there were antidepressants in his system, if you believe that autopsy. There was also paint on the car, which showed that the Mercedes had made grazing impact with a white vehicle later identified, partially due to the chemical composition of the paint, as a Fiat Uno. This French judicial investigation lasts 18 months. It concludes in 1999, and it says, here's what happened. We looked over what you're claiming, Mr. al The crash was caused by the chauffeur, Henri Paul. He lost control of the vehicle at high speed because he was intoxicated. Uh, We have made a 6,000-page report on this, and someone's like, oh, cool, publish it. And they're like, no. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They never did. But British law has to be involved too. This is a former um, member of the government, really. So the way British law works is it requires an inquest to be held whenever there's a sudden or unexplained death. And this leads us to something called Operation Paget or Operation Paget, depending on how you want to go with it. The Metropolitan Police prepare a report 832 pages long. This one is published. It's made available to the public. You can read it now. It has 16 chapters. It goes into what they see as the 16 broad categories that al is raising when he says there's something wrong. They were essentially looking at the stuff that al said would be inconsistent with an accident, a pure chaotic Um, interaction of chance and tragedy or consistent with MI6 having ordered the assassination. And after this operation concluded, they handed it over to a British inquest and six years after demise, uh, Michael Burgess, who was then the coroner for the Queen's household, the British Queen's household, held the inquest. 2008 inquest wraps up a United Kingdom jury with 11 members finds that Henri Paul The driver of the Mercedes at the time of the crash was culpable due to his gross negligence and that, yes, his blood alcohol level was cartoonishly high, three times higher than a reasonable driver should have. Yeah. And they also found that paparazzi, specifically photographers, were partially responsible for the fatal car accident by driving dangerously, driving recklessly, by um, possibly distracting an already inebriated driver with flash photography, which goes on to be incredibly important. The, the coroner, 
for this was a guy named Lord Justice Scott Baker, and he described these verdicts as the equivalent of manslaughter in a criminal court, which is important. That means someone dies due to maybe negligence, maybe you don't have the best intentions for them, but you're not trying to kill them. At least it, yes. And in this case, it's the driver who wasn't trying to kill them as well as the paparazzi. So no one was was like fully attempting to murder anyone, right? That's, mm-hmm. what, we're, that's what he's saying. Yeah. And the French police uh, cleared photographers of being directly linked to it. But again, the Royal Court of Justice in London heard multiple eyewitnesses talk about blocking cars that were allegedly being used to try to slow down the Mercedes or or funnel it, you know, the way like you funnel cattle to a slaughterhouse uh, into certain routes that they could predict. They found the same thing uh, as far as the death of Dodi Fayed. They said, you know, it's drunk driver. It's a, it's a drunk driver. It's a tragedy. The paparazzi is unethical, but this is not murder. However, it should be no surprise that some people still believe there's more to the story. Quite a few people in Britain, here in the U.S., Canada, and around the world are convinced that the official explanation is either somehow inaccurate or purposely a cover-up. More than 20 years after the fact, this conspiracy seems to continue growing. It raises some fascinating points. We'll get to them after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. What if Diana's car accident wasn't an accident at all? Yeah, for people who believe that Princess Diana's death was the result of a homicide or a conspiracy rather than an accident, it goes all the way to Buckingham Palace, to royalty. And, you know, you wonder, well, why in the world would somebody want to take, you know, the former Princess Diana out? She's no longer in your hair. She's no longer doing anything. She's not representing you anymore. Why would you want to take her out? Oh, this is so Game of Thrones. There's the idea that Diana was secretly pregnant with Dodi Fayed's kid as well as engaged to him and that the British queen was, wait for it, royally PO'd by the idea of a Muslim child being associated with the family. Oh, fine. So there's a racist angle too. Somehow, yeah. Hooray. Right. Somehow they were were like, look, it's all well and good. We live in an integrated society, but no no Muslims in the inner circle. There's not a lot of evidence to support that. It's more like an attitude people assume the royal family would have. Interesting. Then there's the one uh, that Charles needed his ex-wife dead to somehow uh, clear the way for this new marriage. Mm -hmm. And many of these claims would have— faded off of the mainstream radar probably were it not for Dodi's father, Mohammed Al-Fayed. He remains convinced to this day in 2019 that the British royal family or the uh, forces under their command murdered his son. There's something interesting here because, you know, we have to we have to be very human again and remember that no parent should ever have to bury their child. So, of course, you want to find reasons for such a horrific catastrophe to occur. So you'll hear people say, sometimes diplomatically, sometimes in a, in a somewhat callous manner, that this man is just grasping at straws because he he can't believe that something as simple and chaotic as an accident could have taken his child's life. But then we see these strange breadcrumbs people have put together and we're going to give you a couple of those to hear and hear what you think. And we'd love to hear from you afterwards as well to let us and your fellow listeners know where where you find yourself in this story. Diana, Princess of Wales, may have predicted her own death. At least that's what her former butler, Paul Burrell, believes. When he came forward in 2003, he claimed that the princess had given him a note, a dated, signed note, 10 months before her death, as an insurance policy. It was written two months after her 1996 divorce from Chuck. Diana claimed in the note she believed there was a plan for an accident in my car brake failure, and serious head injury to clear the way for her ex-husband to marry their son's nanny, Tiggy Leg Bork. This letter is not universally accepted. It's got a lot of press. came forward in a book that uh, the butler wrote. 
Uh, but there are people who will claim that Burl, as her longtime butler, knew her handwriting well and was capable of forging it. Yeah. And at that point, it's who do you believe? That's really what it comes down to. I wanted to ask you, you know, would a, would a DNA test be worthwhile on that thing? Because I would assume it doesn't necessarily prove anything since they were probably in close contact. That's interesting. And whoever has handled it since then, who knows how it was kept. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, handwriting analysis, I haven't actually seen a full investigation into it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. There, there are other... There are other big claims too. Well, yeah. Well, and they, just the last thing with that yeah. is that just because she was she had some fears about her ex husband um, with this other person does not mean that he killed her for this reason. Or I don't. It, it's one of those tough. It's it's a tough thing because just because her, her personal belief yes. was there, even if it was her sincere personal belief, it doesn't mean that that's what happened. Yeah, exactly. That's a fantastic point. I think that's something that many of us accidentally glaze over. But if we're thinking critically, then we have to we have to acknowledge that. We also have to acknowledge a lot of the – I would say the bulk of the conspiratorial claims on al Fayed's part concern secret connections to MI6, the intelligence services. His argument is essentially that the royal family wanted uh, his, his son and, uh, and Princess Diana dead but that, you know, the queen's not going to be out there with a sniper rifle – you know, Prince Charles isn't going to show up in in like a, a weird mech or something or pop yeah. tires. So they say M MI6 did their dirty work. Well, yes. And, and it – let's just – let's game here really fast. If you are going to murder a former princess and her lover, you cannot make it not look like an accident because it will be such a high-profile case immediately – no matter how the death occurs, um, if if you were going to take out a princess or royalty, you would have to make it look like an accident, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's that's one of the other big things that comes into play here because you got people talking about, I mean, spies literally like the the British people paying basically with their taxes to have the princess murdered. But are there any theories surrounding like it with the paparazzi were plants and they were trying to distract the driver and trying to force them off the road? Like do we have any concrete – was there, you know, supposedly any um, manipulation done with the car? Any like tampering with – I mean I, I've never really well, seen anything like any of those claims. Well, well, the claim is you don't have to tamper with the car if you've got the driver on your payroll. Right. That that's that's when it goes back to Henri Paul. And did you know, did he or did he not have any kind of contacts with the world of intelligence or with, you know, people who conduct espionage? Yeah. Theorists uh, as well as his friends and people who personally knew him will claim that he had extensive contacts in the world of intelligence and spycraft. And they'll claim this because of the nature of his employment at the Ritz. The Ritz is a, a place where important people hang out. It's good to have access there behind the curtain. Was he in the pay of an intelligence agency? The evidence to support this theory or the, that purports to support this theory comes mainly from um, an unusual amount of money that was found in his possession at the time of his death as well as his personal wealth, which doesn't – People will argue uh, he makes more money than his position would imply and then the argument follows he was essentially framed for this or possibly drugged or had the results of his autopsy doctored. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. Uh, so the idea that he was not drunk of his own volition, that he was not drunk of his own free will. Right, right. So another – and his his friends and family said he liked a beer but he – you know, he would love to have a night on town with the boys but he wasn't like a problematic drinker. Another allegation concerns the reliability of the blood tests that were carried out. The French investigator's conclusion that he was drunk was made on uh, an analysis of blood samples and this was according to a September 1997 report. A British pathologist hired by Al-Fayed challenged these results and the French authorities carried out more tests uh, but every time they said we see that he is at approximately 
three, three and a half times over the limit and taking antidepressants. That's the thing. This is a point counterpoint opinion war between Al-Fayed and the French government or uh, as he would say, the royal family. There's another, there's a more interesting angle though than Henri Paul. We're not going to get the answers for that, but maybe we can find out more from Richard Tomlinson. Very interesting character. Reminds me of some of the kind of Wild West OSS dudes we talked about with the U.S. intelligence services. Tomlinson worked for MI6. He was a – he's someone who gave testimony to the French inquiry in May of 1999. He said, under oath, mind you, MI6 was involved in the crash. The security service has documentation which will help you figure out what's going on. You have to ask them. Furthermore, I believe that Henri Paul was working for security services, maybe MI6. I don't know. They were working for someone, one of the spook squads, and that this Trevor Reese Jones guy was a contact for British intelligence. He goes on to say MI6 was monitoring Diana before her death. Uh, He told – Mohammed Al-Fayed himself that Henri Paul was an MI6 agent and he said to the guy, he said, Al-Fayed, the death of Princess Diana and your son mirrors plans I saw a few years ago back in 1992 for the assassination of then president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic. They used a strobe light to blind his chauffeur. That was their plan. Wow. And it's crazy, too. You're talking about the strobe light idea, uh, that image you were talking about earlier in the show, um, that is presumably one of these paparazzi images that was taken through the front windshield of the car, incredibly close. Um, It does look like you can see the flashbulb in the driver's eyes, but he also has a a very odd look on his face, yeah, like a little doped up looking. Yeah, I I would concur uh, with with – your assessment there, and it def- definitely feels strange. You got to remember that the lens could be, you know, pretty telephoto. Of course. So they could maybe the vehicle isn't as close as it appears. Mm-hmm. But that flash, and that's the big thing here. The flash is troublesome no matter how far away they are. If it's coming directly in front of them, and if you're a photographer, if you know anything about photography, you probably wouldn't use a flash in that situation, would you? What do you think? Well, from that far away, like why would you use a flash in a tunnel? Like I, I mean, I guess you would if you're moving really fast. You might need to use a flash to get to to capture an image and not have be blurry. Yeah, still seems odd to use it from so far away on glass because if you're shooting through a you know a window, flash is going to reflect and mess up your shot, right? But ultimately, your goal is to illuminate the interior of the vehicle, right? Mm-hmm. So initially, MI6 doesn't doesn't uh, deign this worthy of response. But a source in MI6 later confirms that there were, in fact – this is interesting. Here's their problem with with the guy's testimony. They say, no, of course we had no plans for that. Our own government cleared us after their investigation. Uh, And this guy is lying about this crazy cockamamie plan to cause car accidents through strobe light weaponization. And they're like, oh, you never did that? And they're like, well, yeah, we did, but it wasn't with Slobodan Milosevic. So clearly, you can't believe this guy at all. That was was a different uh, sketchy uh, European dude that we were trying to kill. Anyway, this interview was over. So Tomlinson's claims were never officially corroborated. It's just off the record, MI6 and alleged MI6 members backing him up. However, he was imprisoned in 1997 for breaking the Official Secrets Act. He sent a synopsis of a book that he wanted to write about his career with MI6 to an Australian publisher. He served six months of a one-year sentence, got paroled, and then immediately skipped the country. The inquiry concluded by dismissing his claims. They said it was an embellishment. It's not a lie, but an embellishment. And he said, you know, they said furthermore, his embellishment is dangerous because it's one of the primary reasons people have these theories still that the um, the British elite murdered one of their own. Mm. Tomlinson was also arrested by French authorities in 2006 when they were doing their inquiry into the death. French police at the time seized computer files and uh, personal papers from his home in Cannes. And then eventually 
kind of he kind of got away. They said he wasn't worth prosecuting in 2007. He went ahead and published the book, The Big Breach. People describe him as kind of an arrogant James Bond-esque character. Yeah, I'd say that seems about right based on everything we know. So he was allowed to return to Britain in 2009, get royalties from his book. They dropped the threat of charges against him as long as he had sort of a gentleman's agreement to stop exposing the skeletons in the MI6 closet. It's like they were like, stop talking to the press. Stop talking about your old job. Which, you know, naturally leads us to conclude that he probably had something on him. You know what I mean? They, oh, probably, they yeah. didn't know what else he might have had. Absolutely. Because they basically just said, just leave, leave it alone. We'll leave you alone. Let's just stop. Um, that's crazy. Let's do, let's, do one, let's do one more thing. Okay. What do you say? One more thing. Let's talk about that Fiat you mentioned. Heck yeah, Fiat Uno. That Oof. white that white paint. Real smoke show, those <laughs> things. <laughs> it's funny, whenever I see white Fiat in print, I can't help but think of the Starbucks beverage, the flat white, because Fiat looks like flat on paper. That's a, I didn't know that was a you thing. You heard of a flat white? No. Is it just milk? No, it's like an espresso with milk on top. It looks like a little dot of milk, kind of. Gotcha. But, yeah. So what about that white Fiat? Well, there were witnesses who were there. Obviously, there are a lot of people who were in that tunnel at the time, and seven of them uh, said they saw a white Fiat Uno, the one we mentioned earlier that may or may not have made contact with the vehicle, and a motorcycle speeding out of the tunnel just seconds after, uh, after the crash. And there was a lot of testing afterwards. The forensics basically confirmed that a white Fiat Uno collided with the Mercedes carrying Diana and Dodie and everyone else. And this collision was definitely a significant factor in the crash. Now, that's big. Yeah. That's really big. And then there are other eyewitnesses who told police that they saw a powerful flash of light just seconds before the crash, before the – not the crash itself, like the impact, flash, impact, flash – think about it this way, flash, swerve, impact, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, that blinding that we were talking about, which it most certainly would in a darkened tunnel like that if you had essentially headlights coming right at you all of a sudden, mm-hmm. there would be a blinding effect. Here's the thing. The police say they have been unable to locate either of the vehicles, either the Fiat or the motorcycle, or identify the drivers or the passengers. However, there's a guy, Jean-Paul James Andenson, who is closely associated with this white Fiat. Oh, and we should we should point out uh, they – it might sound strange that they were able to find a specific make, model of car based just on a pigment. Uh, they were able to find that because it was a factory pigment from Fiat. So they were able to match samples yeah, and together. They, there are things like that that are occurring all over manufacturing these days where you could easily identify a certain vehicle, a certain table even, or a pencil or any of that stuff. Don't print out ransom notes on your printer. Yeah, any, you're supposed to use those magazine cutouts. Mm-hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. Any printer that – any printer – that you can commercially buy is going to have uh, identifying pixels that are that are there for a reason. The yeah. world's probably a slightly better place that they're there. I'm not totally against it, to be honest. Only slightly, slightly, slightly. Okay. But uh, but so back to this guy, James Anderson, Jean Paul James Anderson. Uh, he is linked with this. He is linked with this white Fiat. People who believe there was a a conspiracy to homicide are convinced that he was intimately involved with this. He had been threatening to write an expose, an explosive book. Uh, He had links with the Secret Service. Apparently, he met with an author named Frederic Dard to discuss this book. He said it would blow the lid off a conspiracy. And then he was found in a torched car. Allegedly with two bullet wounds in his head. Wow. And the authorities ruled that it was suicide. Okay. Dart also died. How do you torch your own car? You mean the gumption, wait, he, man. Yeah. So the so he and the author both died. Yes. Yep. Uh and Mohammed Al Fayed urged police to reopen the investigation into Anderson's death. 
But at this point, it didn't happen. And, you know, this this story goes on and on and on. Like the, uh, the British public, if you were listening to this in the United Kingdom, you are a member of the most uh, – one of the most heavily surveilled populations on the planet. Uh, there are more closed-circuit television cameras or CCTV cams in the UK per person than there are anywhere else on the planet. So why didn't these catch more of the accident? That's one of al Fayad's questions. It's a fair question. The problem is that's that number we just gave you about, you know, being the most highly observed or surveilled. It's it's tricky. It's number of cameras per person, but most of those are private. So they're not looking out on the street. Yeah. They're looking out at the door of the business, the off license or whatever, uh, which is their name for liquor stores, that, I, that, you know, so that they can identify a burglar. They're not there to monitor traffic. Yeah. The, the traffic monitors come much later and we're still talking 1997. So mm-hmm. that, you're absolutely right. So without, without going into the entire – we would have to do a, a, a mini-series – on the, all the screwy things about this tragedy without going into it entirely, I have to say still, there's one big problem with this, which is that there are other more certain ways to kill anyone. Yeah, that wouldn't be plastered all over the news and have a gazillion photographs of it mm-hmm. what available. Do you, what do you mean? What, what, what's An airplane one crash. But, okay, yeah, there would still be photos everywhere, but you wouldn't be able to prove... It would be it would be easier to just say, oh, it was an accident, I guess. Maybe. Or, I mean, you know, uh, the classic tale as old as time movie device is fake somebody's suicide. Mm-hmm. There was strife in this relationship. They could have written off a princess dies suicide. Yeah. Say, I don't know, execute someone with bullets in a car and then burn that vehicle. Also true. Not And still not as weird as the guy who... Uh, uh, got who got his fixie locked up in a duffel bag. Yeah. Suicide. Yeah. Suicide is, is a huge cause of death for uh, intelligence service uh, operatives, it appears. But, uh, but yeah, I, I wonder about that too. It seems a little bit not, not to be automatically dismissive. It seems uh, at first blush kind of uh, Rube Goldberg esque, you know, unnecessarily complicated. It's, why play mousetrap? Why introduce all these other variables? There are other people on the street. It's a public street. Why flash strobe lights or other devices at people just in the hopes that there's a chance that it causes an accident? And then furthermore, hope that there's a chance that uh, of the four people in the car, one of the ones who dies will be the person you're quote unquote trying to get. Like I can, I can see the sides of this. And I can see how the details are screwy. But what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm definitely with you. Occam's razor is pretty darn strong with this. Just the the pressure that the paparazzi was putting on on the driver who was intoxicated, or at least his his blood, especially when they tested his eye fluid. Mm-hmm. Um, because originally they were testing just, you know, blood. They took blood samples. Right. They test that for blood alcohol. But then they were using the – I forget what they call it. It's not ocular fluid, but it's your eyes. And that gave an even truer uh, – or in, in even harder to fake or introduce like falsely alcohol, right, because of the way it travels through the capillaries and everything to get to your eye. Uh-huh. Um, Anyway, once once that occurred, you can all, I, in my mind, he was definitely drunk, the driver Henri, and the paparazzi were definitely taking flash photographs, and they were definitely speeding. And you put all that together, in my mind, you get accident, and and that to me is really all you need. However, I, it's not that I'm not intrigued by some of the some of the claims oh, that same. Muhammad Al Fayed had. They all though seem to be coming or stemming from that Tomlinson character has. He yeah. still has these. He's oh, never yes, given yes. up the ghost. Apologies. Correct. But it's like you said, Ben. I mean, it's grief manifests itself in all kinds of ways. And like you said, Matt, one of them can be I need someone to blame for this. And you can it can become an obsession. Yeah. Sometimes there's something at the other end of that obsession. Mm. Sometimes it's just an obsession. And it's like you're chasing ghosts. You know, you're punching at shadows. It also regardless of what we think about this personally, it also absolutely does not help that for all all 
uh, virtual, practical, forget it, all literal purposes, the royal family is above the law. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, there are no consequences. And the, you know, if, if the um, PR turns bad for them, they can just uh, have like a Meghan Markle take over the celebrity news for a while. And then some of the um, underlings in MI6 will, uh, you know, will take the fall for it. Yeah. This is life without consequences. That's it. so it's it's pretty it absolutely doesn't mean that they were like, hey, why – let's fake a suicide and then – it doesn't mean this one turned around and was like, no, let's be weird with it. It just means that um, – it, it just means that unlike the vast majority of people on this, this planet, uh, they would not go to jail for a murder. They just wouldn't. Yeah, they would have plausible deniability no matter what. MI5 and MI6 do have licenses to kill. Remember we did an episode mm-hmm. on that. That was really depressing. Not just a clever catchphrase, <laughs> yeah. it turns out. And we're no different. But thank you for checking out our show today, folks. Let let us know, um, where were you when you heard about uh, the death of Dodi Fayed, uh, Henri Paul, and Diana, Princess of Wells? Do you think it's an accident? Do you think there's more to the story? If so, what and why? And that's our classic episode for this evening. We can't wait to hear your thoughts. We try to be easy to find online. Find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on Facebook, X, and YouTube. On Instagram and TikTok, we're Conspiracy Stuff Show. Call our number. It's 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave a voicemail. And if you have more to say, we can't wait to hear from you at our good old-fashioned email address, where we are, conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.